Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. The internet seems to be at the very core of almost everything we do today. It's hard to imagine a time when it wasn't available. To become this pervasive meant turning the internet, and more importantly the web, into an information fabric that can be grasped and utilized by the common man. Today's guest has long been involved with making the internet accessible to people in all walks of life. Hello, I'm Robert Hess, and I'll be your host today as we talk with Terry Crowley a technical fellow and director of development for Microsoft Office. I hope you enjoy this chance to look at the technology and the person behind the code. After graduating from MIT in 1982, Terry worked for over 10 years at BBN Labs. From there, he went to work for Banyan Systems and Beyond Mail. He then hired into Vermeer just before that company and its core product front page was acquired by Microsoft. Today, he is a director of Office Development, focusing on the next version of Office, Office 14. Join me now as I welcome today's guest, Terry Crowley. Okay. Now, Terry, all of us working at Microsoft here, at some point in time, got that bug. You know, the, mm -hmm. the little technology yeah. bug that, you know, forces us into computers and programming or whatever. Where did you first get involved in technology? Well, my dad was actually very involved in, in computers. He actually wrote a book, Understanding Computers. Um, but I didn't really get, get involved in, in computers uh, just, just barely in high school. You know, we, we did a little basic programming. Everybody had the paper tape, the punt that you fed into the, the computer uh, back then. Um, but it w really wasn't until I went to MIT, and I, I, I was originally going to be a chemical engineer. Um, that, that's kind of different, chemical engineer and programming. That's, that's <laughs> it's very different, very different. Uh, but I took an introductory computer course there. Um, it was given by Joseph Weizenbaum, and, uh, and I sort of got the bug there. Um, Joseph, he wrote a book called uh, Human Power and, uh, Compu uh, Computer Power and Human Reason. And um, there was one line from that book that I think captured really what, what got me excited. And, and uh, it was um, you know, something like, no general has ever commanded more power than a computer programmer you know, programming uh, uh, his, his environment, his world. So uh, you're, a, you're a power fiend, in other yeah, words. Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, <laughs> I wanna, it's all about control. <laughs> now, um, so from there, you switched from being a chemical engineer to being a computer programmer. Did that, that happen instantly, or did over a year or so? Or? Well, it was a, I took that first course in the freshman year, and I, and I actually sort of found I was pretty good at it. Uh, and, uh, and then that summer, I got an uh, internship at Bell Laboratories, uh, which is where my dad worked as well. Um, and that was my first introduction to programming in C and, and uh, getting a lot of experience with Unix. Um, and, and sort of I got excited. I found I was pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so when I went back in the sophomore year, I sort of, that's the direction I took, and I got much more involved in, in computer classes at that point. So I bet your dad was pretty happy that you were following his footsteps, kind of. I think he was pretty excited to, to see me sort of go down that path. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, I understand you actually come from a r r rather l large family. So there's 14 kids in the family, seven boys and seven girls. I, I, I have a hard time grasping that in my <laughs> head. I mean, because you were you were kind of on the younger side, weren't you? I was the tenth. Yeah. 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 So, I, mean, so I was I was the, there was the uh, the old kids or the big kids and the little kids, uh, and I was on the little kid side. Yeah. Now, how, how many of your siblings then went into computers and technology? So um, a bunch of them went into uh, my two younger brothers also went to MIT. It's and, kind of funny and, you're talking about your siblings. A bunch of them. <laughs> a bunch of them. <laughs> 
Um, two younger brothers went to MIT and, and were into computers. It's actually my youngest brother who's, who's still, I think, actively programming. He's probably the only one who's actively programming besides myself. Um, and, uh, and then some of my older brothers who, who got into some more business analyst type of, of programming. But there's a few doctors and lawyers and CFOs and other people, other uh, uh, disciplines or, mm -hmm. or professions in that crowd. Now, in your, your early days, you worked at BBN Systems, yeah. where you worked on this program called Slate. Yeah. What exactly was that? So Slate was a uh, multimedia document system, is what we called it. And, and so it was basically a word processing system where you could put spreadsheets and graphics and images and, and audio clips in it. And it was also sort of connected to email, so I could email these rich documents around. Um, it started off as a project called Diamond that was funded by DARPA. And this was, what year was this about? So Diamond was, was in 83, 84. Um, and then, and then as, as that project was initially funded by DARPA and NSF, and then we, we turned it into a commercial product called Slate mm -hmm. um, in the, the late 80s. Mm -hmm. um, so when I, when I first joined uh, BBN, I had a workstation that, that um, had a 200 megabyte hard disk. And, and I think it was... <laughs> It was probably another 12 years or so before I had a hard disk that big on, a, on an actual PC. Yeah, yeah. During this time, especially since you mentioned like, you know, emailing with, with Slate and stuff like that, yeah. the internet was really kind of an undercurrent for computers. Yeah. And stuff like that. A lot of people were using the internet for doing FTP and, and file transfer and access and stuff like that, um, long before the general public really understood what the internet was. Um, and so you were kind of involved in some of that, some of that internet development stuff. Well, so, so BBN was, a, was one of the sort of core uh, developers of, of the internet. Um, you know, the, and the people I worked with were, were involved with that. I, I worked with uh, Ray Tomlinson, who, who famously is the, the guy who picked the at symbol for email. And he, and he actually, it turned out, he wrote the first intermachine email program. And, and I worked with him for 10 years, a fabulous engineer. Uh, and Ginny Travers, who I worked with very closely, um, wrote the first internet router. Uh, so, so that you know, I was definitely very, very close to them. And and, I, and a lot of the, I was on some of the internet uh, task forces, and you you interacted with you know some of the famous names. John Postel was was someone I worked with quite a bit, and he was was sort of very very famous in the internet development. Mm -hmm. Now, in those days, did you? Did you comprehend that the internet would become as ubiquitous as it is today? It's, it was, it's, it's kind of uh, funny. I think there was, the people who were involved definitely felt this is different. This is, people just don't get it, what it's like to, to be working on a computer and to be you know, 30 milliseconds away from any other computer on the internet. You know, at the time, we would work a bit with, uh, with some of the Bell system uh, folks, and, and they were thinking about you know, T1 lines and direct uh, you know, conferencing between one computer and another. And we're like, going, why would I ever want to connect to one other computer? You know, I want to be connected to all these other computers. And so, so there definitely was a feeling that this is different and people don't quite get the, the difference. Um, but you, you, it was still uncertain where it was all going to go because um, there's, you know, there was a lot of the land manager and, and Banyan had their system and, and uh, DEC had its own system and exactly where, how it was all going to evolve. It was not completely clear that TCP IP was going to take over the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, back in those days, I was working on, on DEC systems. Right. And so we had DECnet that was right. linking our PDPs together and stuff like that. And it was a big deal. And just to connect up one computer next and get a file transfer, man, we right. just, wow. First file transfer going across, yeah. and I'm sure it's kind of the same thing going on for you. Is when you first go to those connections and seeing those bits going across the wires. Yeah, no, I, it's the you know the first furnace connectivity is just yeah. you know yeah. is pretty exciting. Um, but it was definitely it was it was a different world because I think that in terms of the size that you know I tell the story about. Uh, when, when my, comp my workstation that I was working on was we were going to put it on the internet, and there was only a couple hundred machines on the internet, and so it's kind of exciting to have the computer <laughs> you're sitting at on the internet. Nowadays, of course, everybody says, well, of course your computer's on the internet. Um, but, but there was no domain name system. There was no hierarchical naming, and so there was just a flat name system. So I, I sent a mail message to 
John Postel. And I said, hey, I want to name my machine Pearl. And he goes, ah, you can't name your machine Pearl because there's a machine at University of Massachusetts that's named Pearl, and you got to pick some other name. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so that was it. There was a single person that was deciding which, what you could name your computer. And one, one unique name for the entire Internet. Yeah, right. So it wasn't until the domain name system got in place where it became, you know, you could name it whatever you wanted. How long did it take, do you think, to go from, from being the one name to the... Oh, I don't remember the exact sort of history. That was in the sort of 80, middle, mid to late 80s as it sort of moved into that. You know, yeah, because you would almost think that you should think about it almost immediately. You realize, hey, if I want more than 100 computers connected here, we need to yeah. have more than just uh, yeah, well, I mean, names. It seemed like it should be obvious, but, you know, I think getting big was the, you know, the, a lot of folks who were working on the Internet th thought about getting fast, you know, getting, you know, go three, one megabit per second, three mm -hmm. megabits, you know, and moving up. But there was a pretty good understanding that the problem wasn't getting fast. The problem was getting big, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of the number of, of individual nodes on the Internet. And mm -hmm. Now, for most people, their, their connection to the Internet comes through the web. Right. Um, now, and the web is relatively a recent newcomer mm -hmm. to, the, to the Internet world. Prior to that, we had, you know, FTP connections and gopher connections and a bunch of other right. capabilities. Having been involved in the early days of the Internet, do you see the, the web as being the forcing function as being kind of unfortunate and you wish some of the other technology using prior to that is, as having value as well or are you are you glad for the web no i actually i think the the web was was sort of a uh, there was a couple of sort of brilliant insights about that and some just being at the right place at the right time um, i mean the the neat thing is is like i said it was when the folks who were working when we were working on on uh, these, these internet programs, I was doing real-time conferencing where you're connecting, you know, multi-users and, and uh, doing this. Th this thing about how do I actually show that, that I've got a computer that's co that, that just milliseconds away from any other computer. And the neat thing when we, you know, the, the first web pages were all list of links. You know, that was everybody. Everything was lists of links. And, and, and the neat thing was you had one page that, boy, I could very easily go from one site one you know to another computer and th and that and the web did a great job of of bringing that home that you were actually you really were connected to all these machines you know and just milliseconds away from each of them mm -hmm. um, so it was a, it was i think when that came it was like okay yeah why didn't you know i looked at it and said mm, should have got that <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of obvious in, in retrospect i mean hypertext was something that um, was was there? Everybody was building hypertext. I built a hypertext system. It was a local help system that built on top of the Slate uh, infrastructure, and but it was a local one. It wasn't. It didn't pull all the pieces together the mm -hmm. way that the the web did. Mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I mean, Slate itself sounds like interesting. I, mean, I never saw it until I was chatting with you about this. But yeah. I mean, the fact you had this this rich text and audio and video stuff going across. I mean, back in those days, when I was sending email, it was just raw text. And right. if someone was doing a picture across, it came across as mime encoded, and I had to take that mime encoded text, paste it into a separate file, and run it through a program to bring it through. But it sounds like right. you actually were tying everything together. Yeah, no, I, we, it, I think it was another, after I left BBN, it was probably another sort of five or ten years where I felt like I had as rich a, a set of tools at my hands as I did when I was working there. Uh, it was it was a pretty capable system, mm -hmm. despite the fact that it was about five of five devs, and and we eventually added one tester, um, <laughs> but um, which is pretty, you know, it's neat that we could have delivered that. Although we did deliver one version of the product where I think a menu, if you pulled it down, the product crashed. Yeah. <laughs> did nothing about special about the state. It was just if you selected that menu item, the product would crash. That's where testers are important, right? <laughs> I'm, I have great respect for tests. And it's kind of interesting also to, to see that you started off with this rich tech system and now you're involved in Office, another right. big rich tech system. Do you right. see a lot of similarities between those two? I think uh, it's, it's been interesting how um, many of the concepts that I, I sort of learned and, and built into systems sort of early in my career are still relevant uh, at Microsoft when I'm working on applications there. I, I remember sort of the first conversation I had with, with Peter Engrave about the OneNote architecture, and, and we started talking about it, and, and immediately we sort of drove to the sort of key topics about, you know, design of these systems that, you know, really I was working with, you know, for, throughout, throughout my career. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of sort of consistency about the way these systems are designed, even, even today. I mean, you know, the problems we're facing are basically the same problem. It's just the, 
the, the quality of the solution sometimes can improve and leaping off the shoulders of someone else until you finally get better yeah. and better systems. I mean, yeah. I'm not sure how many, how many fonts you had in, in Slave. Yeah, font was a, fonts were a big problem. Yeah. Uh, the X window system in particular, which we moved to from after sort of some of the early systems we were working on, uh, has a pretty uh, painful sort of font system uh, underlying it. Um, actually, one of the first programs I wrote was a font editor. Because we didn't have enough fonts when we were on our, our this custom workstation that we were using uh, at BBN, and and so we said, well, I'll build a font editor to write it. And that was way before I understood how hard it is to design <laughs> good-looking fonts. Um, but uh, that was fun. You probably didn't like bitmap fonts back then. Oh yeah, totally. Just completely fonts. bitmap. No, yeah. bit, no vector fonts. Yeah. You wouldn't. You yeah. wouldn't. Th these were uh, machines. Were they were called 3M machines? They were sort of one. Megabyte, one megahertz processor, and and uh, and then you had a mix, one megapixel display, mm -hmm. um, which seemed you know like incredible amounts of resources, and now we're a factor of uh, or three orders of magnitude greater than that. Now, as I alluded to in the entry, um, one of the things that I think makes the internet extremely useful and and popular is the fact that it, it addresses itself to more than just the geeks of the world, but mm -hmm. it actually addresses itself to the common man. Yeah. Um, and the web being the thing that people come up to from that standpoint, I also see front page as being a very big part of that story of making the web real, because mm -hmm. now you have a tool that the common man can actually create web pages with mm -hmm. without having to get into the HTML. And, and you were you know, quite involved with, with front page early on. Uh, what right. was that like? So that, that was, it's sort of an interesting process. I, I, I had worked at Beyond Mail, so I left BBN and worked at Beyond Mail, and uh, a couple of um, my friends at, at Beyond Mail went off and, and, and started Vermeer. And I s didn't quite know what they were doing uh, because they kept things very, very quiet, um, but then soon found out that they were building an HTML. I understood that they were building an HTML editor, and I'm looking and going, that's great. I mean, you know, Microsoft is going to build one, Adobe is going to build one, whatever. And how do you compete with uh, just building an HTML editor? And, and then, and so it was pretty neat when I when I got a demo as I was talking with, about joining them, and 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 sort of realized that they weren't just building an HTML editor; they were building a whole, you know, the the website as the as the metaphor of the thing that you're building, and and page editing is just one part of it. And the, the link to the dynamic execution at the server, and it just, it just, wow, the, the numbers, of the, the things you could do with a product like that where there was a, there's just huge room for innovation in different areas um, got me just really excited about, about joining up with that. And I also was the case that when I understood how they had built the HTML editor, I said, mm, there's some things I could teach you about how to build <laughs> editors. Um, and so it, it was, I was excited about that I could bring some, some sort of direct value to that, um, but recognizing all the other value that they had already sort of built. Yeah, because it continued to build on your strength. You started with Slate right. of doing this rich editor, word processing sort of capabilities. Right, exactly. And, I, and I'd also sort of built a rich text editor at, at Banyan and, and whatever. So I'd done a whole number of, of mm -hmm. editors along the way. Um, and so I was able to come in and, and, sit, and, and really give some sort of guidance on, on the way to, to architect that system. Um, and it took us... A few re we were shipping so frequently, and it took us a few releases before we got it sort of to the architecture we wanted. But uh, but over time, mm -hmm. we did that. Now, had you been doing much with HTML before this time? I had been just playing around with it um, at Banyan. The the uh, we did the um, internet enabled version of the the mail client. So I did the POP and and SMTP protocol support for for that, and I did the rich text editor support for the Banyan uh, mail client. Um, but, but we were just, that was just at the transition point where, where we were sort of viewing HTML mail as, as a way of sending rich text content. There were a couple other less functional ways of encoding rich text in, in email. And, uh, and with the rise of the web, it became sort of obvious we should just use HTML as the, as the rich text content. So we were starting to get some experience there, but it was really Mm -hmm. Then when I jumped into into Vermeer, that I sort of became deeply familiar yeah, with. Because you know, that was kind of a big problem with rich text. Because since the internet was with internet email was meant to go from machine to machine, you had no idea what machine you're going to. So it might be standard on a Macintosh, wouldn't be standard on a PC, wouldn't right. be standard on on some other system and stuff like that. And that's where the, where HTML then provides that connectivity between those systems. Yeah, I mean that. I mean that's one of the, the these 
issues that just getting standard, as getting it standardized was, was critical, that each of these systems had, had various different sort of capabilities in those areas, but, but getting them all to agree that, yeah, we'll just use this is, was what was the critical thing that mm -hmm. enabled sort of the ability to, to send the rich content. And then the flip side of that is you need a graphical text editor that can take and then convert to HTML because right. otherwise, the, whatever your standard word processor is, you'd have to expect that to convert to HTML, which maybe it couldn't because that wasn't the standard back in those days. Yeah, there. I mean, that's an interesting topic. It's a hot topic actually right now because we're with with document standardization uh, with ODF and OpenXML and, and whatever is is that these underlying systems have different models for what for what a document is and what text is and 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 how to to structure it and. And the assumption that they're, that you can map from one to the other isn't necessarily true. That, mm -hmm. that that they have very different models that they're trying to present to the to the user, and and then how they encode the information. Mm -hmm. I and mean, because quite often the word processors are they're they've got internal things that they're really trying to do and accomplish, which HTML maybe can't handle without having some special encoding going on inside. And you know, partially that's why CSS exists because they need to take a launch on top of HTML. Right. And even so, there's there's other ways, other things you might have in a document that you might not work properly um, in HTML. Yeah, and and I mean, one of the things you saw with with when when Office went down the path of encoding, you know, Word documents in HTML is 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 they needed to add a lot of additional context around uh, um, the HTML information in order to, to carry along the, the semantics of, of the document and uh, versus just the visuals of the document. You mm -hmm. could get the visuals pretty straightforward, but then either it wouldn't edit like it had previously edited. And so carrying the semantics was actually, is a tricky issue. And, mm -hmm. and if you don't have, if the, you're coming at it from two different models, then, then it, it becomes difficult. You lose information when you map mm -hmm. from one to the other. Mm -hmm. And that, that also gets into an issue that I know I, I personally had with front page when I was first yeah. starting to use it is is you know I like doing HTML in, in Notepad, right? And and then when I pull it when I used to pull it into front page and then drop back to Notepad <laughs> again, I say oh that's not the HTML I wrote. Yeah, uh, HTML preservation yeah. is is a uh, I, I I could I could go on for an hour <laughs> talking about HTML preservation. Uh, I mean it's an interesting it's actually kind of an interesting story because because when when front page w first started and 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 in in fact, you could hear quotes from Tim Berners-Lee, who, who the you know creator of the uh, of the web, that he assumed that nobody would be writing hand you know handwriting uh, HTML. That it, eventually everyone would go to these these editors, and and so the assumption is is you know all editors work by sort of pulling the content in and, and mapping it to an internal representation, and then you fiddle with it, and they they map it to a, an internal representation that makes it easy to manipulate, and so and then they write it out. And and mostly people don't look at what it what got written out, um, but but in fact because people were were both wanting to hand edit uh, information, um, they expected the editor to to not change anything. Um, but in fact, not changing anything is actually really hard because uh, you because you you want to map it into an internal representation that's that's conducive to to editing um, and keep track of. Before and after shots, and right, and it's yeah. it's actually uh, incredibly difficult because there's a lot of information in a in a in a hand edited uh, HTML file about you know spacing and case and of, of tags and attributes and and whether you use quotes or don't use quotes and things like that that are totally immaterial to the actual the semantics of the content and mm -hmm. and yet from a user's perspective they might be very uh, material to the way they want to edit it to look um, and so. So really, it was over over time. Front page ninety eight was the first version where we we started trying to do a, a good job about this. Two thousand was a whole new rearchitecture again, trying to do a much better job. And then it was two thousand two, and then finally two thousand three, where I think we we had the best uh, preservation in the industry. Um, but everyone always assumed that there was a little there was something in there that we did to pollute their HTML, <laughs> as opposed to how difficult a technical job it is not to to change anything. Um, on, th on the top of that was the other trend that was happening, which was um, server-side uh, pages, pages that, that were expanded on the server side. And so what you were actually editing when, was not HTML, it was ASP, or ASP.NET, or PHP, or, or, or these different server-side languages. And so there was HTML embedded with code. And so they, they expected us to read these pages, which aren't really HTML, and then do nothing to the, you know, and then only make the changes. And, and that was, it's a tremendously difficult job, and I'm actually proud, very proud of the, of the work 
the team did uh, to, to the quality of the job it does mm -hmm. now. Uh, now, are you sad at the moment by the fact that front page kind of doesn't exist anymore? Yeah, so so front page uh, diverged into two products. So so actually, there's there's I'm both. It's a bittersweet. Uh, um, the front page. Uh, was a very damaged brand at, at a certain point. I think partly because it got so much success so early and it ran into these issues of HTML preservation and other things that, that a lot of people, um, and a couple other decisions. We made a decision about theming to, to sort of spread HTML uh, uh, codes and comments throughout the, throughout the HTML to support this notion of theming. So you could, you could simply make a quick change and would change all the fonts and background colors and things like that. Um, and so there was a couple of features we did that generated, you know, this that sort of expanded the HTML and the ugly HTML. Um, and, and so front page as a name got this bad reputation among sort of the high-end HTML uh, coders. And, um, and despite the fact that over the course of a number of releases, we, you know, really focused on HTML preservation and, and clean code and whatever, it never sort of lost that, that reputation. And, uh, and so I think that what we did is, is focused on SharePoint Designer, which is, of course, sort of building on the great success of, of the SharePoint product, and then uh, Expression Web, which is really focused on this high-end professional web developer. Um, and so, so I, I now have two products that are, that are the base of one of them. Actually, three products, because the Visual Studio Web Design Service is also based on front page, um, the front page design service. So, so I feel good about my code lives on. So you got uh, yeah, three products rather than just one now. Right, exactly, yeah, right, exactly. Right, right. Uh, now, where do you see the future of this web design market moving to? I mean, is the same concept moving forward? Do you think something a new problem coming up? Well, so so I mean, the dynamic of the of the market has 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 been pretty interesting because because essentially we were focused on we were assuming that there was going to be this sort of broad lower end of the market and and uh, you know and and in fact what happened is is these these tools like SharePoint and these blogging tools and these things that are very focused on, on not sort of general web editing and web authoring, but rather these very focused ways of contributing content um, really sort of took over the, the lower end of the space. And so the, the essentially the hobbyist market has sort of went away or it's, it's you know, sort of a very small market versus the high end sort of web design authoring market and then these, these sort of website you know, self-service website mm -hmm. uh, market. So um, that's been a theme, and it's gonna, that's a theme that's going to continue because it, because it's, it is you know these browser-based authoring environments are 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 pretty easy to use, and and there's some, a lot a lot of technical advantages to that approach. Um, the other sort of big, interesting you know sort of evolution is around some of these rich internet application, you know whether Silverlight or Flash-based sites, and and sort of how they are going to evolve into, um, you know, the way we, we see the web. Um, and there are good things and bad things about, mm -hmm. about those approaches. Because the whole concept is being able to embody the developer's solution designer's concepts to get those things to the users, right. whether it's through HTML or, like you said, Silverlight or Flash or ActiveX or whatever. Right. Um, the, the difficulty, of course, is that HTML has some nice characteristics around searchability and, and archivability and, mm -hmm. and, and issues around accessibility that um, sometimes when you build flash sites, you don't get those benefits. You have to, it's harder to, to get those same benefits that HTML brings. And so, and so really thinking about how both you can create a great end user experience, but not lose some of the, the, the benefits that sort of an HTML-based web gives you is, yeah. is important. Yeah, I mean, I regularly see entire sites that it's basically one web page with very little HTML code and just right. an inclusion of like a, a flash object in it that essentially is just this black box as far as the search engine things like that are concerned. Right, which is which is sort of painful for, for all these other different uses. And so, yeah. so, I mean, so one of the things, interesting things is when you think about these technologies is thinking about sort of the overall, the whole ecosystem about how these technologies interact and, mm -hmm. and uh, and so I think there's still a lot of room for innovation in thinking about how these rich content types and interaction types sort of merge with, with these other, uh, other capabilities of the internet. Mm -hmm. Now, you're, you're focusing now on the next version of Office. Yep. Are you, see that as an evolution from your front page work or is it a shift in your duties? Well, it's a pretty big shift 
in terms of uh, sort of general responsibility for sort of overall development in, in office. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it's amazing how much of what I've learned over, over the course of, of 25 years or so in the industry is still relevant uh, in terms of how we build applications and how, how you think about applications that interact with remote data and how you, what's the proper way to structure them so that you, get, you can create responsive applications. It's, it's, um, that's, an, that's an area that I've been working uh, a lot on is, is how you design applications so that they're always responsive and, and, uh, and don't hang in, on interacting with remote sites. So that the user's never really aware of the fact he's using a program that someone wrote that might have little paths that needs to go in and stages. I want to write a document, I want to access files, and bang, it's... Right, and, and, and I think the important thing that we, that we sort of have to realize is it's, it's different than when you're working on a single computer with a hard disk that, that you know exactly how long it's going to take to read a file and whatever. When you're interacting with the internet, things are inherently, you don't know. Mm -hmm. And so you have, to, you have to write the program differently, and you have, to, you have to think about what the user experience is going to be as the user's waiting for that file to come in and, and the error conditions are different and, and you can't just make it transparent or, or ignore it. Um, and, and I think we need to do a better job there and, and we're going to do a better job. Um, so we're pretty excited about some of the things we're doing there. Well, enough talk about work. Okay. Let's talk, let's talk some fun. Now, I'm, I understand that um, you've got a, an outside hobby of playing what they call ultimate frisbee, is yep. that right? Yeah. Yeah. I know nothing about ultimate <laughs> okay. frisbee, other than the fact there's a frisbee involved. I'm, I'm assuming. Yes. And it's not a, not an ultimate frisbee, but it's just a frisbee you're playing this yeah. ultimate game with. Yeah. So, what what exactly is okay? Ultimate so frisbee? ultimate frisbee is a is a field sport. So it's played on sort of a football field uh, football field sized uh, field um, seven on seven. So there's seven people on one side, seven on the other. You can't run with the disc. You you have to throw the disc to one of your teammates, um, and and you, the the goal is to is to throw it to one of your teammates who's in the end zone, and you score a goal when that when that happens. Um, and the other team is trying to knock down the disc or intercept it. Um, and as soon as it's it's turned over, the other team is going the opposite direction. So it's a lot like soccer in that respect, where you go back and forth very quickly. Um, so it's a it's a very uh, active sport, lots of running. Uh, it's a great sport. It's, uh, it, it was invented about 10 miles from my home. Um, so, so I've been playing. Not, not your home here in Seattle. Not my home in Seattle, but my home in New Jersey, where I grew up in New Jersey. Um, and uh, to my everlasting regret, my younger brother actually played on the original you know, parking lot field where they, they used to go play on Friday nights. And, and he, he actually was the one who really introduced me um, to, to playing Frisbee. He actually went to the, the mythical first field. Ooh, ooh. Um, but, but I learned it at, at, uh, in high school and then went to MIT and played there. And then, and then uh, the team at BBN, I, got, I was very lucky in uh, playing with a bunch of, uh, it was the corporate league in Boston. And uh, a bunch of the players that I started playing with ended up going on to, to join some club teams and ended up winning you know, world and, and national championships. Uh, and so I, I was sort of was lucky enough to play with some amazingly good uh, players. And I still play. I played four times this week. So, oh, really? Wow. So wow. I still play regularly. Even, even this wet weather? Uh, actually, Seattle is a perfect uh, temperature for it. You can play year-round. So. Hmm. Now, so is it, is it a, like... Cackle style game? No, okay. no, no. <laughs> when you're talking about parking lot, I'm thinking, oh, that sounds like yeah, right. the football. Yeah, right. Like no, a... there's there's no contact. There's a thing called the spirit of the game, which is which is that you know you don't foul intentionally, you don't do something that's that's likely to injure someone. Um, so it's very different than other sports. Even at the highest levels, it's self-refereed. There's no referees. You call your hmm. own fouls and. Uh, and you know you have interesting. Obviously, it's not a professional sport. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, you have interesting things where you have these high, very high level. You know, the finals and nationals, and there'll be the crowd will be surrounded, and somebody will make a foul call on the field, and the crowd will boo if they think it's the wrong call, and the guy will go, "Okay, I'll take it back," and and not, you know, and so it's this interaction with the crowd, and and this this notion that every you're supposed to be sort of respectful of the other team, and. Uh, it's a great sport. It's a great sport for kids. I coached my kids, uh, young, two younger kids, middle school team, and, and 
always working to, to make it a bigger, mm -hmm. bigger sport. What are the things you do for, for fun besides programming an ultimate frisbee? Uh, I ski, so I, I do a lot of skiing. Uh, my, I have a 16-year-old son uh, who's, who has recently totally passed me and <laughs> dominates me on the slope. Um, but I like to do that. Uh, I like to read a lot. And, and uh, we have a place out at Lopez Island and go out there. You mentioned a couple of different sons. How many, how many kids do you have? So uh, I have a 16-year-old boy, a 14-year-old girl, and an 11-year-old boy. So you're getting your start on that 14-kid family, right? Yeah, right now. yeah I'm done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Three's a good number. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you're saying that from, from experience of being a child of, of 14 kids or just? Uh, it was great growing up with 14. You know, it wasn't, a, you know, at the time, there, there was all these, you know, it's cheaper by the dozen, and yours, mine, and ours, and whatever, and, and the Brady it, it was never, it was never like that. It was, it was uh, much more, it just seemed much more, con it, it was normal. Yeah. You, weren't, you weren't building volcanoes in your back patio and stuff like no, that? Yeah, yeah. No, no, it was, it was pretty normal. I, I think the one sort of odd thing was, you know, we only had two cars, and so that was back in the, you know, 60s and early 70s and whatever, and you used to just pack kids into cars, you know. You can't, you can't live like that anymore. You'd be arrested yeah. going down the thing, you know. You have two people on the back, you know, that, you know, how those cars used to have the back thing to lie on, and you put two kids back there. and Just start shoving them in. Right, like, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Now, here at Microsoft, a lot of people, especially when you've, when you've been here for a while, you have a tendency to, you know, I suppose collect things in, yeah. in your office like that. And, and uh, when I stopped by your office chatting with you, I noticed you had a nice collection of things in your office. So we actually took a little tour of your office, and let's take a look at that. Okay. Um, let's see. I have um, right over here, I have my uh, a, a uh, poster I got at the end of my BBN tenure career um, showing all the different products and projects I worked on, little snapshots from that. Um, Let's see, here we have a Buckaroo Banzai um, cup. I'm a great Buckaroo Banzai fan. I'm not, I'm not sure everyone knows what Buckaroo Banzai is, but uh, laugh while you can, monkey boy. There's, there's a whole number of lines from that movie that, that you can live your life by. Um, and uh, famous uh, boxing gloves after a, a uh, this, this I was given to, from a PM who I worked on with a number of features, and we used to have long drag out fights about, about the design of the feature, and, but in the end we respected each other. Um, I also, this is, this is one of, this is the oldest book here, and this is uh, it's the Bell System Technical Journal, it's a, and it was the, the first uh, combined journal about the Unix time sharing system, and, and uh, my dad gave the uh, introduction to this. and, and uh, I, I grew up on Unix, so I have a big Unix background. Well, I think I saw at least one Frisbee in that office shot. Yeah. I'm sure you had <laughs> a few like more. Five there. of them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, before we pass over to the audience, get some direct questions from them that you're going to mm -hmm. answer. Uh, we've got a few questions we like asking all of our guests and just kind of see how they respond to it. Uh, right. Don't worry, it's, it's not a test. Okay. So there is, are no right or wrong answers. I like tests. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the first question is, um, what advice do you have for people in your field? Um, I would say one of the things that, that I've seen, if you look at, at people who have been sort of very successful, I think one thing you, you see as a pattern is that they're folks that have that have become experts in in some area. They've become or or the expert. You know whether it's the expert in the way Word works or the Excel Calc engine or the you know the various other parts of, of uh, our systems. Um, that you you need to get a deep deep expertise in in some area and and so. I think actually devs have a tendency to want to stay in, in one area very long and, and you know and certainly my career shows that I was at BBM for 10 years <laughs> and um, the uh, but but if you don't get that deep ex expertise uh, I think you don't get the respect uh, from from the people you need to, to be successful and and I think also you you learn something when you go deep uh, about the design of systems and the, and, and how to construct systems that you can't get from just sort of a surface knowledge. Um, 
So become an expert at something. I think is is important. Um, you know, I think I think uh, another sort of take on that is 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 also that in in virtually anything you you work on, if you're not sort of successful in that, um, it you know every once in a while you hear somebody saying, well, it wasn't a good you know opportunity, or it wasn't interesting, or it was a boring task, or whatever, and and certainly. What I've discovered through my career is, is actually some of the boring tasks are the ones that end up being sort of the mo in, most interesting ones because you say, boy, if I'm going to work on this, I better have come up with an interesting solution to this boring problem. Um, and and uh, there's sort of lots of examples where, where you end up doing some of the funnest stuff on a problem that initially looked, looked like it was uninteresting. Mm -hmm. I, know, I know for me, I always, I always like string parsing for some reason. <laughs> and string parsing sounds really boring, but I, I like getting into strings and you know, figuring out those equations and yeah. figuring things out from that standpoint. It's like yeah. you know, owning the problem. Yeah. 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 So um, how would you describe your work to someone who's not technical? Um, well, I'd say, for, first of all, I have, I have somewhat, a somewhat easier job in the sense that, that uh, Working on Office, sort of people sort of understand what Office is, and so there's a certain familiarity with that. Um, so, so that's that makes my describing at least what, what position I have as, as easier. Of course, the other reaction you get uh, is they say, "You mean you're doing another version?" You know, <laughs> you, actually, you get two you two two versions. One is like, "Aren't you done?" I mean, what, what are you going to be? And then the other, the other reaction you get is, is please tell me you're not done. You know, that there, there's definitely uh, there's people who see opportunity for improvement. Um, and we see lots of opportunity for improvement. Uh, so at least in terms of what generally what I do, it's pretty easy to, to get that because of Office is pretty well known. Mm -hmm. And then also, for, you know, probably people know you work in office, and every time they call you, they end, they end the, the call off with, oh, and by the way, oh, yeah, how, right, do I... yeah, right, how, how do I do this? Yeah. Yes, you get a little uh, technical support. Yeah. Uh, I get those from my family every once in a while. <laughs> and with that large family, you probably kind of yeah. build and build. Yeah, yes, uh, right. exactly. Uh, in life, what would you compare producing software to? So I like to, let's say, I, I would say com building uh, good software to, to architecture. Um, you know, I think there, when you think about how to, sort of modularize something and, and, and have it sort of broken up well, a program broken up well, um, then you can think about how sort of the good design of a, of a house or, or something. I think, I think architects maybe have it a little bit easier because, because it, boy, if you snake a cable through the, you know, you can do that in programming <laughs> and it looks really ugly. It's a lot more obvious that it's ugly when, when it's an architect doing something. Well, why don't we put a, you know, a, a tree, you know, a tree line or a you know zip line down here. <laughs> oh, oh, maybe that that's a little more obvious when you're designing. Yeah. They just heard that with a gargoyle or something like yeah, that. We do that in programs yeah. all the time, yeah. and it's really bad. Um, I think the other thing is is I like to, uh, you know, I think good programs are beautiful things. I mean, there's an aesthetic to programming that uh, I think sort of matches. I think a, the sort of aesthetic of of sort of designing a building. You have to you have to if you don't have that aesthetic, you're willing to lump things on and I think you end up building sort of complex, fragile systems. Mm -hmm. Do you think that architecture shows through that? I mean, in architecture building, anybody walking by can see that, whereas like the architecture of, of office, don't you actually have to see the code to really understand how the routines are interacting? There's certain, but I'm, I guess I'm sort of relating it to the person who's deep in it, who's involved in it, who's looking at it. But you're, but you're right. I mean, that's one of, that's, that is one of the advantages of, of architecture, that, that you can sort of, it's laid out there. And, and I've always, you know, thought we need to do a better job of, of how do we visualize our programs? You know, just reading through a, a you know, a flat listing, is a difficult way to to get a get a real understanding of, of whether it's been sort of broken up nicely. And and we sh we, there's various research projects that have, that have done some work to 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 think about that, how to explore, sort of the visualization of a complex system. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, yeah, that is that is sort of one of the difficult things. But I think the the basic aesthetic of building a nice system and and designing uh, a building or whatever feels similar to me. Mm -hmm. I've had uh, good roommates and others that are architects, and so there seems to be similarities there. Mm -hmm. So uh, finish the sentence. You know, you're a computer nerd when. Uh, when you're so excited by 
the algorithm or data structure you just designed that you go and tell your spouse about it and try to describe it to her. <laughs> and then you find, mm, maybe I need to find somebody else to talk to them about this. Uh, but uh, there's definitely been a number of times where I said, this is so cool. I need to go, I really want you to understand this. Um, it doesn't quite work, right? It doesn't take much. Yeah. My wife's a smart person, but this, she's not a computer programmer. Does she get into computers much like you know HTML? She, or? She, not HTML. She's she's very techy. She's almost sort of more techy with me with new devices and other things that she always wants to jump on uh, quickly um, from that perspective. She's more of a technophile rather than a, yeah. a techno enabler or something yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 Um, so <laughs> lastly, uh, what we do is take and ask everyone to uh, draw and explain your favorite data structure. Okay. Um, so we're going to give you the opportunity to to check out your artistic steals, okay, skills. Okay, which, which are very bad. Uh, so, so anybody who knows me would be stunned if I didn't uh, pick a gapped buffer as the, <laughs> as the thing. So I'm, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and do that. I'm going to pick a gap buffer. Gap buffer is a data structure that uh, I first learned about in reading about the Emacs text editor. Um, but... Um, it's usable in lots of other cases and it has some interesting sort of characteristics. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, my drawing here is a little goofy. Uh, has a, it's, it's an interesting uh, data structure from another number of perspectives. So here's my attempt at at drawing a gap buffer. So, so the idea is, so of course one of the simplest data structures in, in computers is just an array. Um, and so you start off with an array and then a, then a common thing that people want to do is build an extensible array. So what you do is you, you allocate some large amount of, of data or some, some amount of data and, you, and let's call that sort of max lang. But then you're only using a smaller amount of data, let's say lang. And so that these are the the locations they're actually used. And so the nice thing about that, the extensible array is that you can uh, add new elements for constant cost or delete things at the end. And so a, a generic extensible array, typically, the gap is at the end. So a gap buffer basically takes the extensible array idea and, and says, well, the gap can actually, instead of being, having to be at the end of the array, can actually be in the middle. And so what this, what this means is that as you, as you want to do insertions or deletions, you move the gap to that location, and then, and then you can do insertions and deletions in, basically in constant time at that point. Um, and so it's often used for, in, you know, in Emacs, it was used as a tech, for the text buffer, so you, where you're typing is where the gap is, and, and so, so typing and, and inserting and deleting around the gap is, is, is very easy. So the nice thing about, about this data structure in terms of sort of pe think, talking about data structures in general is, is a couple things. One is... Um, it's sort of super important, locality, it's all about locality. The, the performance of this data structure is all about sort of the, the locality of operation. And it, and it turns out, as we think about uh, sort of memory hierarchies and, and the way that, that even the, the way that multi-core is impacting things, that locality is just more and more important, in fact, in terms of designing, thinking about how our systems sort of are architected for, for having good locality. Um, and then the other, other interesting thing about this is it's a very efficient data structure if you use it the way it's designed to be used. And it can be very inefficient if you, if you, if you don't do it that. And, and there are no perfect data structures. And, and, uh, and knowing what the characteristics of the data structures you're using are and knowing how to use them um, is, a, is actually is pretty important. And so, and so the gap buffer is sort of a classic in that. It's great for, for what it's designed for. Um, but if you try to misuse it, it can be it can be bad for you. Um, so this is at the core of Emacs, and, and in fact, a front page, if you, if you look at front page data structures, their gap buffer is all over the place. Um, and I could go on for another hour or so <laughs> talking about that. Yeah, and and you, you preface this by saying, anybody that knows you, you didn't do a gap buffer. I mean, why are you so known for a gap buffer then? Well, this is, you know, the one thing is about front page. The, the uh, the front page, I, I would say one cool idea I had with, with front page, maybe you could 
come up with a few cool, other cool ideas, but but um, was this idea that uh, that how do I manage selection in a complex system? Selection as in where what area is selected to operate on, and and in particular in a, in a tree-based system, selection is typically handled by a list of pointers to nodes in the in the elements in the tree, and and. And that can be very awkward for and, and fragile in terms of as the, as the system gets bigger and more mm -hmm. complex. And so the design of, of front page was was the notion that that you you stick sort of sentinel characters in the underlying uh, text buffer, and then you can use selections on that text buffer as the sort of core selection object that can be used throughout the system. And it's a very robust, performant uh, sort of underlying selection model. And that and so I always. Made that big point. That was that was the, the very uh, sort of cool aspect of, of uh, the design there. Well, it seems like you know you really own this this data structure then. <laughs> so before we go into asking the audience questions, let's go ahead and sign this for us. Okay. Make that permanent. Now, I, typically you can't read my signature, so I try to do a good job there. So I mean, that's not your signature. You're trying yeah. to say. <laughs> Okay, so now we're uh, ready to open up for questions from the audience. Uh, does anybody in the audience have any questions for Terry? What is one of the most challenging technical problems you've had to solve, and how did you solve it? There was a really scary problem that I that I had to solve. I, that and maybe I'll, I'll pick that just because it was an interesting technical problem, but but it was actually sort of in, it was it was scary from a professional perspective because <laughs> uh, when I, when I was working on Front Page ninety eight, uh, I, I had just. We had shipped front page ninety seven, and then I had worked. I had then worked to deliver the Macintosh version, while the rest of the team went on to, to front page ninety eight. Um, and and so I joined the the the, the ninety eight team a little bit later from the from the the other development, uh, the rest of the development team. And uh, but that didn't prevent me from ripping up the entire core of the editor's <laughs> design service <laughs> and sort of throwing it up in the air. Um, I think I went. Three weeks without compiling because I was rewriting everything, um, and then and then uh, I was actually uh, several weeks past. The rest of the team was code complete, and I, and and things just weren't coming together. Uh, I, w I had this design for the the display surface and the d data structures and the internal data structures that uh, that I was having a tough time sort of getting to to sort of working state, and and so I remember uh, I worked like. Every single day for for you know twelve hour days, sixteen hour days, in, in in that April, trying to get it going, and I I went home to have dinner with my family uh, one night, and on the way back I sort of had this insight that I was going to back off of the the what I was trying to accomplish uh, in terms of the, the complexity of that data structure, and I was going to uh, take a simpler approach, um, and I proceeded in, over the next two hours to sort of code that up, fixed a Couple compile errors and one bug, and had it working that evening, um, and and that's what we ended up shipping in FP98. Um, and then in front page 2000, I ended up sort of finishing that that full design that I was looking for um, and and doing it. Um, so that was really the the point where uh, sort of in contrast to to BBN, where there was like five of us working on it, and the project product maybe had 15,000 users. This was you know front page. There was, you know, a lot of people working on the product, and if I screwed it up, it was a big <laughs> screw up. <laughs> so that you, was you wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be here today, <laughs> right? So that was a little scary. Uh, another question from the audience, right here in front. Hey, Terry. So Microsoft is famous for having some uh, challenges in its cross-group and cross-division collaboration on software. Can you tell us about one of the challenges you've worked through and how you managed to get through it? Uh, okay. That's a that's an interesting question. Um, I think uh, one interesting experience we had was around uh, sort of the front page design service and and the relationship with Visual Studio. Um, for a long time, Visual Studio was pushing a, the Trident based surface, and and front page went down a path that said we're going to sort of own our own core surface, and and there was a lot of Sort of interesting discussion back and forth about what the right strategy there was, um, and back in 2002, uh, we 
worked, and this was was driven uh, by Harley Rasnow, who who worked for me at the time. We we worked through with the the uh, Visual Studio team in terms of them understanding what our technology was and what we could deliver uh, into their product, and and essentially drove an agreement where we took the front page design service and and delivered it as part of a the expression product and then also into the Visual Studio product. And I think that was, you know, it was a, it was a long process of, of getting to the point where th there was agreement that that was the right right direction to go. And part of it was developing the technology internally in, in FrontPage that, that really addressed their requirements. Um, but it involved getting people on their team that, that, that thought it was the right thing and getting them sold on it and then and they, there needed to be internal drivers there on their side as well as, as folks on our side who, who saw the value in, in working together. Um, so, so that was a, it was, it was critical to get the people sold on it and then, and then, but also to have the technology, the right technology choice there. So. Now, cr cross-group interaction like that can be extremely important in a, in a company the size of Microsoft. Yeah. Um, did you take learnings from that and apply those to other pro similar type problems you might be having later on? Well, I think I think one of the things we've seen is 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 the importance of knowing the people and getting to know the people. Uh, I, I had a a uh, a great opportunity in working with the this multi-core virtual task force uh, that has people from around the company, and 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 that was a great opportunity for me to to really. Get a chance to know those people and 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 work with them on some deep technical problems and and I think when you sort of develop those relationships, it makes it a lot easier when you're going in, where you have some issue, some product issue or a product uh, decision to make to to based on if you can go in based on having a you know mutual respect for the people you're working with, um, it ends up being a lot easier. So. Those those relationships are a big a big part of being successful. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, quite often you know, I explain to people that you know, you know, to understand Microsoft, you almost have to envision as being like Silicon Valley, but up in the Pacific Northwest. Silicon Valley has all those companies out there, and we are not just one big company. We're a company of of companies, and so quite often the conversations don't always flow as smoothly the, as you might expect otherwise. Yeah, I, th I think I think one of the it, it's funny when you read it. A news, a, you know, a news article that talks about Microsoft decided this or Microsoft decided that, and I'm going, there is, there is no person named Microsoft. There's, there's lots of individuals, and and uh, we had actually an interesting uh, sort of learning when we first joined, uh, you know, as front page. We we were very lucky because uh, Chris Peters, who had been the head of Office. Took over and and took over to become head of front page. So he went from leading a team of fifteen hundred or so people to forty people. Um, but he was incredibly insightful. And one of the things, as we went through the first process, where we go the, the triage process, where we go through and make decisions about which bugs to fix and how to fix them and whether whether not to fix them. And and uh, and one of the things that he pointed out there was was. You know, it's the decisions you're making in this room with three people, with a dev, a test, and a, a program manager, about about these that end up being Microsoft. This is what Microsoft decided. Well, it was three people in a room trying to make the best decision they could for the product, for the user, um, and and that's where some of these key key decisions are made. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Terry, from the Technical Community Network, and being our guest today. And thanks to the audience for coming by.